Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, and yes, a warm welcome from me as well. And many thanks for the invitation um, to take part. Um, I'm very honoured to be at an English pen event and also to chair a panel with two such distinguished contributors as the author, Cathy Renson-Brink, and the publisher and critic, um, Kate MacDonald. I'm always delighted to talk about Kennedy. Um, I started reading her novels um, almost 20 years ago when I began working on my book, um, Women, Celebrity and Literary Culture Between the Wars. And I also made a memorable visit to her archive at Somerville College in Oxford. Um, but at the time I did have trouble getting hold of quite a few of Margaret Kennedy's novels, so I hadn't read all of them. And that's had a, a pleasant result, which is that I'm now um, still finding more books to, to discover and finding out lots of new things about her. Um, so The Feast was one of the novels that I think in about 2005 I had to go through very hastily um, using a library copy that I couldn't borrow. So it's only thanks to this wonderful new edition that I've been able to, you know, savour it on my sofa. Um, and I think this is a, a marvellous novel, so I'm really looking forward to hearing about what um, Cathy thought of it as she wrote the introduction and what Kate's reaction was. And I'd like to thank Kate as well for introducing me to um, Kennedy's superb war memoir, um, Where Stands a Winged Century, which she brought back into print a few weeks ago. And these newly, yes, <laughs> exhibit A um, <laughs> with handheld press. Um, and I think these newly republished books are, are connected in lots of ways, but two in particular. Um, the first connection is the Second World War. Um, the memoir covers the period from May to September 1940 when Britain was expecting invasion, which didn't happen, and bombardment, which did. Um, and The Feast is the first of Kennedy's novels to explore the post-war um, situation in England, although um, we'd like to think a bit more about the origins of the story and her thinking during the um, 1930s. And then the second connection is geography. Um, both books are set in St. Ives, which she renames Porth Merrin. Um, and Margaret Kennedy knew Cornwall from her childhood holidays. And then she went to live in St. Ives with her children in 1940, as described in the memoir, first in a house and then in a hotel. And this is one of the aspects of these two books, which um, I know especially interests Cathy as she's from Cornwall and lives there now. And also me as my father's from Cornwall too, um, from Hale, just near St. Ives. Um, and the feast takes place in a hotel in a site that the narrator of the novel says um, used to be called Hell's Cove and then was renamed um, Pendezac Cove. And I wonder if this is a reference to the real um, Hell's Mouth, which is a tiny cove just up from St. Ives that I can remember quite well. So I was looking to see if there had been um, a large landslip, which features on the first page of the novel um, around there in the 1940s. I couldn't find any reference to one in that particular location, um, but there was a major landslip in Hell's Mouth in 2011 with exactly the features that are described in the novel, including all the cracks appearing in the path um, on the cliff above. So I feel as if there's some uncanny predictive quality to this novel, something almost gothic. So I'd just like now to turn um, first uh, to Cathy and ask you how to just outline how you came to write the introduction and where your own interest in Kennedy came from. Um, well, it's such a pleasure to be here. Hello, everyone. Um, I read The Constant Nymph years ago, and then more recently, over the last couple of years, I've just become very interested in, um, well, I mean, I've always been fairly interested, even more interested in women writing between the wars and then in the Second World War. And so the first thing that happened in my sort of Kennedy love affair happening this year was that I had a press release for Where Stands a Winged Sentry, and I, uh, and I read that and then asked the Times if I could review it because I was actually very struck with the, I felt very connected to the thinking of this writer in 1940 assessing the risk of what was happening. And it, it really resonated with me thinking about the way I was processing the pandemic. And then in some, again, almost mysterious spooky way, I had a communication <laughs> via my agent from Faber saying, um, 
you know, because of the Cornish connection. And to be honest, I was a bit busy. So I was sort of halfway through typing out, you know, I can't possibly. And then I thought, well, I did really enjoy the other thing. I wonder if I should just have a quick look. And of course, as soon as I had a quick look, they sent me a, um, a PDF version. As soon as I had a quick look, I was just, I mean, smitten is the only word. So I had to, um, I had to delete the email saying, no, no, I'm too busy and replace it with, <laughs> yes please don't dare ask anyone else to do this I desperately want to do it um because I did because I just utterly adored the novel um I, I mean I really do and I would now quite like time to stop so I can just read everything and become encyclopedic in my knowledge um I do really enjoy I love that feeling when you want to plunge into a writer I love tracking the development of the writer's thoughts and also the development of the writer's thought against uh social events, global events, what's happening. So it, it sort of it really rings all my rings, all my bells, floats all my boats. And also just the writing is so good and precise and clever and uh, detailed, granular. So very transporting both books, I think. Thank you. Yes, wonderful. I like the way that these fates conspired here. <laughs> We're definitely developing the Gothic theme. Um, so can I turn to um, Kate McDonald? Um, can, I know that you were reading The Feast um, for the first time, although you knew several of Kennedy's other books. So I'm just wondering what was your first response to it um, in the light of the, what else you had read of Kennedy? Um, did it surprise you in any ways or did it connect to your, uh, what you already knew about her? Well, I, I found it a hard struggle. The first two or three chapters, I thought, I've, I've, I've said I'm going to talk about this, I have to read it, I have to enjoy it, I really have to do this, and I was surprised at how resistant I felt, but I think it was because of the characterization. Um, the characters who are most appalling are presented pretty early on, and I really hated them, and I thought, these can't be true, these aren't real people, this is, this is dreadful, how can this be? And then gradually, as I moved through the book, I found myself saying, no, 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 I don't need to go shopping. I, I don't need lunch. I want to finish this book and I'm not going to move until I finished it. And I sat up very late one night and finished it at about half 11, I think, because it was a complete page turner and I loved it. And my mother is getting it for her birthday. So please, mom, do not be at this, um, do not watch this webinar. It's just tremendous because Kennedy's grasp of how to unpack a story and give you everything you need to know about individuals and then you yourself are putting together inevitable consequences ahead of what you're reading on the page and thinking, oh no, I know some people are gonna die, but please not that person. I don't mind that one going, and, but not the children, or maybe, maybe one child. And it's this sense of being, you know what's gonna happen, but you, could decide how it's going to go. I find that fascinating. It's a, a terrific read once I got over my initial hump. And I think that's a terrific description of it as well, actually. I think that really, really gets to how it hooks you in, um, mm. I must say. Um, yeah, but, um, can I just stay with you for a minute, Kate? I mean, as, as a publisher, I mean, what do you think about the new attention that's coming to Kennedy now? Because Perhaps we could say she has been uh, rather forgotten for some decades, but now there does seem to be a resurgence of interest in her. I mean, where do you think that's coming from? How does it relate to the um, celebrity that she experienced during her lifetime? It's very difficult to say. Um, I don't actually know what else is in print. I assume The Constant Nymph is in print, and that's a novel I couldn't get through. I think I maybe read it too early, and I, I hated it so much I did not go there again. The Ladies of Linden was in print because that was an early Virago, I think, and I, I've got that edition and I love that one. I don't know what else there is, so not knowing where people might be coming from, it's, it's just impossible to tell. It could well be that people coming to Kennedy Cold might think another Elizabeth Bowen, another Elizabeth Taylor, another mid 20th century esteemed and distinguished writer who did much more than just novels. Oh, look, she did stage plays, she did film scripts. Let's give it a go. And then the sheer quality of the writing is what pulls people in and spreads the word because in publishing word of mouth is almost more important than a big flashy advert in a magazine. Because if your friend tells you, I love this book, you must read it and here are two copies I want to give to my sister and my, my brother-in-law 
that's a guarantee that goes to people's hearts. Um, so if a, if a book can get word of mouth praise, that will do it so much good. And I think Kennedy is that kind of author. People talk to each other about Kennedy. Yes, I think you're right. This question of word of mouth. Um, I mean, we were thinking also about the, the sort of literary circles that Kennedy herself belonged to, but now we're almost kind of a later literary circle forming around her in a way here, aren't we? So mm. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and coming back to Kathy, um, what do you think about the actual story itself and where it came from? Um, I know that we just very briefly mentioned earlier that sort of Genesis of it over a period of time, but there's also the fact that you've then recently read Where Stands a Winged Century as well. So you're kind of thinking about that trajectory from the pre-war to the wartime to the post-war. So I wondered if you could say a little bit more about that. Yes, I find that very interesting. So in the original, um, in the original novel that was published, it does say on the fly leaf, it gives the sort of the origin story of the book, which is that it, the story of the writing of this book begins in 1937. She was with a party of her friends and they were all novelists and discussing the seven deadly sins. And they began to imagine the seven as modern characters. They had the idea they should all write a short story. And then the project fell apart, um, partly because projects like that sort of do fall apart. I often have ideas with writer friends and they so often don't come to anything. Also because they were all worried it would be a bit too depressing. And again, in terms of that, um, just reaching into the past, uh, so many times when I'm talking again with writers about, oh, well, I, I mean, so many of my own conversations with my writer, with my editor, like, oh, I quite like to do this. I'm just worried it'll be too depressing. <laughs> so I really, I just felt so connected and bonded to both Kennedy and this circle of writers. Can I get away with this? Can I still make a story out of this? Can I, how am I gonna do this? Um, and then as it says, she so she stopped the, joint project, continued to kind of mull it over and then had the idea that she could gather the sins as people in a hotel run by the unhappy wife of Sloth. And it was apparently when she started thinking of the other characters, who else would be in this world? And that's when the novel caught fire. Uh, so I think everything about that is just is just very interesting. And I'm also fascinated because, of course, if the project had happened in 1937, it would be an entirely different book than it is 10 years later. And I think the development of the way that she's thinking in her nonfiction, uh, written in 1940, you know, a lot of which in the memoir, it's transcribed from her diary. So it has a very immediate quality. Um, preoccupations about things like how to, you know, I'm, she says at one point about being with the children, I'm a stick to the children like a burr, she says. Um, and again, as a modern reader, that's that one of those moments where you think, well, like, don't we stick to our small children? But of course, in the 1940s, it would have been much more usual to have the children somewhere else with some childcare. Um, then, of course, in the novel, then there's, it's a, I think with a very light touch, because I don't think she's a judgmental writer. One of the reasons I like The Feast so much, and although it, although in some ways she br has a brutal ability to look the truth of human weakness, frailty, sin, if you like, has an incredible ability to look at that full on. But actually, I still think the writing is overall, uh, overall it's a sort of compassionate kindness. Um, but you can see the development from what what was what she was worrying about in 1940, what was preoccupying her in 1940, to what she thinks of the world in 1947. So I think it it feels like such a privilege to track that, you know, to see that development in thought in the same writer. And I do feel, because it's not always true with novelists, but I I I feel you can really feel that it's the same sensibility. I can see that the writer of the nonfiction shares a sensibility with the writer of the of the fiction. Those ten years later um, and also just the same wonderful novelists eye for detail um you know which again is the thing i really love about the, 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 there's these poor children who have a horrible mother and just the line you know they look like plants that have been grown in the dark i mean isn't mm -hmm. that just utterly brilliant so mm -hmm. yeah so i think that they they again i like the way that they arrived at me from completely different directions uh but there's a they, they do feel like very complementary companion pieces to me. So 
I, I would I want to give both of them to everyone together <laughs> <laughs> you read them in any order though I don't think you'd need to read them chronologically and then tell me what you think because I would like to discuss it with lots of people please <laughs> yes I agree they do make beautiful companion pieces this is really well timed <laughs> And did you, Cathy, have any questions that you wanted to put to Kate um, at all? Oh, I could ask Kate for years about how she selects the books that she publishes, um, many of which I already really love, including Business as Usual, which um, I adored when I read it. But Kate, perhaps I could ask, I know that you've mentioned that you've read The Mechanised Muse, um, mm -hmm. and I haven't read it, so I wonder if you'd perhaps tell us a little bit about that. I will. So, The Mechanised Muse, this is a very, very thin little pamphlet. You can see end on, it's barely there. It's published by Penn, it's a hardback, and it came out in 1942. And it's by Margaret Kennedy, printed by George Allen in Unwin. And it is a non-fiction pamphlet about the development of writing for film from the transition from silent movies to the talkies. And we know Kennedy did this, and she's very knowledgeable and interesting about how writing for the screen evolved from simple um, mummery and play acting into proper nuance, as well as the development of technology and how cameras helped writers do continuity, for example. But there's one little bit, when I, I already found a little section in this book, which is a direct lift from uh, Where Stands a Winged Sentry. She reused the material, and that's interesting in the context of film. But I'm just gonna read you this little bit here. Some years ago, an English author was discussing with a Central European director the plot of a Hungarian novel which he wished her to transpose into English suburban life. She complained that there was not one possibly decent character in the book. They all acted solely from motives of greed, appetite, cowardice, or self-interest. They showed the most complete callousness in their attitude to one another and seemed to be entirely devoid of any sense of responsibility or moral obligation. She feared that they might be thought unsympathetic and asked if the story might not be altered a little. Might, could they not behave a little less badly? Might not extenuating circumstances be introduced? Might it not be at least be possible for some of them to show signs of distress, scruple or inner conflict? And when I read that, which I, I mean, I'd already read it, but I read it again last night. And when after having read the feast and I thought, well, that's the feast. That's another iteration of her origin story of how the feast came to be. Now, whether she was actually talking to a film director or whether she just stuck some bits of anecdote together, because she uses this as a, uh, a moral lesson about how different countries and different cultural audiences have different responses to nasty characters and good characters and morally sound and morally pure endings, none of which is really relevant here. But the fact that she named sins I think is so interesting because these are the sins she wrote about in the feast. This came out in 1942. So in 1937, Kathy's story about how she was talking about the idea, she's still thinking about it during the war. It hasn't gone away. Yeah, I love that. I find that so interesting the way so often with writers, there's a almost like a possibly a finite amount of preoccupations in the revisited and that you can get in a sort of a push-pull relationship with a preoccupation or a material or a character or a storyline mm -hmm. and then kind of be and then like oh I'll have that later I'll come back to that I'll have that later I'll come back to that that's wonderful thank you yeah yeah it's good and I wanted to ask you Kathy have you read any Elizabeth Gouge or Elizabeth Gouge Elizabeth Gouge no nope. no nope. okay <clears throat> many people in the audience may not have read Elizabeth Gouge but she was an extremely popular novelist from the late 30s through to the early 60s, I think. And one of her most popular novels, and it's the one I read a great deal as a young teenager, is The Herb of Grace, which is about characters who are morally corrupt or in, engaging in adultery, and they gather in a guest house, and their, their sins are basically leavened by the presence of the one shining light of purity. And when I was reading I mean, it's not as po face as it sounds. It's actually a really fulfilling, fabulous novel. It's a bit Christian, but that part can be set aside if that's not your interest. But when I was reading The Feast, the moral tone, which is upheld by Nancy Bell, 
I kept thinking, I know this, I've read this before, where is she getting this from? And later I thought, blimey, she is taken from the leading character in Elizabeth Scrooge, The Herb of Grace. I'm not saying the plot is taken, although the, the fact that they were once gathered in a, in a guest house is interesting. But the idea of purity and innocence heading forth into a den of unpleasantness and people with various characteristics of different sins, it was happening in 1948 in this novel by Gooch, which was phenomenally popular, a real bestseller in its day. And I can't think Kennedy didn't know about it. So I lay that before the jury as well. I do love Nancy Bell. Uh, one of the other things I like about both, and actually one of the things I find interesting about West Ends of Winged Century is there's very little about being a writer. It's about mm. being a mother, the personal yes. the occupations of being a mother, what you do with your children. Um, mm. And I found that interesting because again, I wonder either she doesn't write it down or she didn't feel what she, she doesn't, and maybe it's because she didn't, maybe it's because the situation was so grave. She didn't feel any of those sort of um, slight professional regrets that, Mm -hmm. uh, I know a lot of writers were feeling at the beginning of the pandemic a little bit like oh I was about to go and do that really fascinating thing whatever and that's off I've yeah. just got to sit at home and again maybe it was because everything seemed so grave at the time that she didn't mm -hmm. have reflections or indeed possibly felt that they didn't sit well but there's so there's very little about being a writer but there's one brilliant bit where she has a bit of a swipe at some poet who's gone off to doesn't name them I think I think it's a poet and I think they've gone off to Canada because mm. they can't think well enough. Yes. Because yeah. like, is, is the poetry more valuable than your services as a fire watcher? And yeah. There's something wonderful like, um, but if they think that there's no material for poetry here, then they are a blind worm, which mm. I really like. But then there's lots about writing in the feast and writers, again, having a nice little dig. And I love Nancy Bell. So Nancy Bell is a sort of a straight talking antidote really to, I mean, not the only antidote. There's plenty of there's plenty of people knocking around who have set up a fine contrast to all the baddies. Um, but I love I love this bit where she's talking to a, a, the aspiring novelist who's um, trying to court her, and he's working on a novel. And Nancy Bell doesn't like the sound of it. She says, "I like books about nice people and a story where it all comes out right in the end." <laughs> and then. Bruce accuses her of not wanting to face facts. She says, not in storybooks, I don't. I face plenty between Monday and Saturday without reading about them. <laughs> and again, I just thought that was yeah. so clever and, you know, the sort of the lightness of touch there. But again, mm. um, a, again, a preoccupation you can see, probably because this is, again, as a writer, people will say this sort of stuff to her, won't she? And she will All think the time, yeah. So. You're not going to put me in a book, are you? <laughs> Did you notice that each one of the characters who represents a sin, they share, they share the same initial? So Lady Gifford is greed. Raxton oh, is wrath. That. Yes, of course. And um, Cove is covetousness. And help me out here, people. Who are the others? Yeah, I did make a little Lechery, list. Lechery, Lalesh. Was it Lalesh? Yeah. yeah but Ellis, and Ellis is yeah. envy. Ellis and Rambi, yeah. yeah. Am I the only one to have spotted that? That's yeah, nice. Yeah. I like that. Yes, Canon Rayton is yeah. right. Yeah. Sidol is sloth. Yeah, yeah. I haven't noticed that. <laughs> oh, I haven't noticed that either. <laughs> <laughs> Ten points to Kate. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> and do you think that the focus on sins is a dramatic device or is it actually also an exploration of faith? Mm-hmm. Faith? Do you mean morality or Christian faith? Christian faith, I guess. Mm -hmm. Do they go to church in the novel? I can't recollect that they do. They do, but it's only when Bruce is trying to eye up Nancy Bell and thinks she'll be in the church, whereas yes. she's actually in the chapel. So none of the holiday makers are actually interested in going to church. Well, and then there's, the, to there's the dreadful scene yeah. when the yeah. canon embarrasses everybody by Yes, oh, that's right. He's shouting, and, and, it, mm. and then Evangeline um, has hysterics, and rightly so. And then there are the two um, high church ministers at the very beginning who meet for their annual holiday to play play chess, but they can't because the sermon has to be written for the funeral. And the um, whole thing, I think, about whether it's an act of God, and then right at the end, what when the uh, the cliff falls, and I think one of the children says. It's the atom bomb, it's the atom bomb. And there's this wonderful line, which is something like, 
these children believe more in more that bad acts will be done to them by man and would be an act of mm. God. That I've expressed that badly. It's better than it's, that in the book, but that sort of yeah. idea. So I think, um, I, I mean, I would be, I'm, I'm interested in faith, but I'm no theologian at all. I'd be really interested in what someone did think again about both books, because one of the, I found the, she talks about the National Day of Prayer in Where Stands a Winged Century mm. and just that notion of the king tells us to go to church, so we do it. And 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 her own beliefs and how they how they are there and then how they how they're worked in the novel. I do find that I find that really interesting. Again, I don't mm -hmm. quite know whether there is any authorial intention um, or whether it's uh, again whether it's just a I think sometimes writers just sort of like almost like pop stuff up and then let us do with them what we will so I yeah. don't know whether she's I don't think she's necessarily suggesting a way that we should think about it um but I find it interesting that it's there and again that the story is framed with the with the mm. churchmen um who do offer but of course with the, you know there's good church people and sort of bad church people a bit simply mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Plenty of that going on. Yeah, I would have described it rather as a novel of, of as a morality tale. I mean, with the, the presence of the sins brings it straight into allegorical territory. But I don't think as a novel about faith because faith is not overtly expressed by anyone, um, except in the negative sense of Canon Canon Ruxton um, causing chaos in a, in a in a church he disapproves of. But that's not the right way to do it. No, it's because because the, the good characters, the characters with whom the, the reader is expected to feel sympathy and empathy, the, they are morally pure. They do try to do the right thing. They might not always do the right thing, but you know, even Bruce decides, I've got to stop doing living this life. I'm going to you know, do the right thing and leave. So we are led to expect moral, morally sound behavior in terms of conscience and doing unto others as you would have done unto you as the right way to proceed. And those who are generally bad, like Miss Ellis and Mrs. Coe, and even selfish Lady Gifford, um, they're bad and we should not we should not behave like them. So I would, yeah, I would say morality tale rather than faith-based tale. And it's also interesting, isn't it, that they do all get the invitation. Everyone is offered the opportunity for salvation. That's true. And I think that's yes. really interesting because again, and, and I do feel that speaks to the authorial intention of, mm. again, not. I don't think we're being told. You know, I don't think we're being told um, these people are bad and now they're going to suffer. It's like they all get that chance again to redeem themselves and don't take it. Yes, they actively choose not to take the, the path of righteousness is too strong a word, but the path of decent behavior. Yeah, the 50s. human yeah. being, just being a fairly decent human yeah. being. <laughs> and that moment when Mrs. Cove sees her children apparently drowning and does nothing, that is a jaw-dropping moment of how can a character do this? This is something very wrong in that moment. That's a very, that's one of the most powerful moments in the novel, I think, because she's behaving so wrongly and we feel it. And also, I think par parents in general. So um, she's very clear sighted about the well, the negative ways in which people can parent. And definitely, again, I think seems to suggest that often children would be better off without their bad parents. I think that's yeah. that seems to be an inescapable confusion. One thing I just wanted to mention before I forget on because I thought about it earlier on Kate when you said about um that's another thing I like about I like reading everything of an author because I do like to see the way that the things uh, recover and there's one phrase that she uses in both books and I particularly noticed it because when I when I read it in the first one I started using it because I like it so much and it's it's when someone has a stiff row to hoe and yes. she's about the king so in where stands a winged century where she when she talks about the national day of prayer and she says the king's told us to go to church and we will she says it's something like it's because we we respect him because we think he has a stiff row to hoe and mm -hmm. he gets on with it and then uh in the feast she says it about jerry siddle and his father again that his because of his father he has a stiff row to hoe and yeah. i just think it's such a wonderful uh it's such a wonderful expression so mm. I've been littering my communications with it since reading it. 
also embodies in the qualities of perseverance, dogged endurance, which are, you know, effortful. You cannot do these things yeah. lightly. And I think also a compassionate understanding on behalf of whether it's the author or just people. I mean, the phrase I would usually use myself is I like, and actually it's from when I, one I got from growing up in Yorkshire, people would say about someone, they'd say, oh, you can tell he had a big paper round. <laughs> <laughs> again, it's that sense of carrying weight, you know, that we don't. Yeah. And actually at the end of the novel, again, she says people picked up the burden of their separate mm. lives. So this idea of how we're weighted down by circumstances, definitely by who our parents are. Um, yeah. But that also then we can offer compassion to each other because of this mm. having a stiff road to hoe. Mm. And then maybe take the, you know, be offered opportunities for salvation up yeah. to us as whether or not we take them. That's wonderful. Thank you. And I'm just going to say thank you so, so much, Kathy and Kate, for these comments. And thank you, everybody, for all these wonderful um, questions. I think we got to almost all of them, but one or two of them. Um, I've just saved the chat, actually, because there were so many fascinating things in there. Um, lots of other little connections that people were drawing. So thank you 